human shields are increasingly used in modern conflicts, uh, exposing civilians and other protected persons to high risk of death and, and injuries. Using human shields is a violation of international humanitarian law and a war crime under the 1998 sorry, uh, Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. In their recently published book, Human Shields, A History of People in the Line of Fire, Neve Gordon and Nicola Perugini described the use of human shields in key historical and contemporary moments across the globe. Recount, recounting incidents uh, of human shielding over a span of 150 years, while looking at how the laws of armed conflict have dealt with the phenomenon, Neve and Nicola explain in the book why and how certain people have become human weapons and how certain manifestations of violence come to be con conceived as humane while others are perceived as immoral. So first I'd like to, to thank you both, Neve and Nicola, for taking the time to, to talk about this incredibly timely and interesting book with me. Thank you, Frank. And, and actually, uh, I'd like to begin with, with you, Nicola. Um, what made you write this book? Um, so while we were working on our, on our previous book, The Human Right to Dominate, uh, between 2012 and 2015, so between uh, uh, Operation Pillar of Defense and uh, uh, Operation Protective Edge, uh, we repeatedly encountered Israel's accusation that Palestinians uh, uh, use human shields as a warfare strategy in the uh, Gaza Strip. Uh, the accusation was not new. It was it started already in 2006 with the war on Lebanon, but then it was rehearsed uh, repeatedly in this two round of war on Gaza. So. Israel's argument uh, was uh, straightforward. Uh, since uh, Palestinian, uh, Palestinian armed group deploy civilians as human shields, uh, basically placing them in front of legitimate military targets, Israel is not responsible for civilian casualties. We, we started realizing that this kind of line of reasoning uh, was common also in other uh, theaters of political violence in other areas of war uh, from the military uh, campaign against the so-called Islamic State in Iraq to the wars in Yemen, in Syria and, and, and other areas. Uh, so different political regimes uh, from Russia to Israel to Saudi Arabia were using the same identical accusation. And the fact that uh, hundreds of thousands of civilians basically across the globe uh, were suddenly being cast as uh, human shields seemed uh, odd and basically uh, prompted us to ask a series of questions. So why, for instance, has the figure of the human shield become so prominent in so many uh, uh, wars uh, 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 in, in the Middle East? Uh, what does this figure of the human shield tell us about the broader uh, uh, global history of political violence? Or, for instance, why are some people used or defined as human shields, whereas others uh, are not? So we quickly understood something important, that the human shield is a very peculiar figure that is simultaneously two things, a human and a weapon. And as such, because of this duality, it destabilizes uh, some uh, uh, fundamental legal and ethical categories uh, and assumptions that we use in order to make sense of violence. So when we began reading about the history of human shielding, we were particularly intrigued by how this very small, relatively marginal and controversial figure of the human shield is able to produce uh, a series of moral and, and legal uh, quandaries, uh, moral and legal uh, dilemmas. So how should a humane, or so-called humane warring party react uh, when uh, confronted by enemy uh, uh, combatants who hide behind civilians? 
Should it refrain from shooting to protect the civilians who are being uh, exploited by its enemy? Or how is it possible that residents who are trapped in an embattled city, in an, in an area of war, at times are portrayed as human shields and in other uh, instances are portrayed as simply innocent civilians? What makes the difference? Or from a different perspective, uh, does volunteering as a human shield uh, in an attempt to become, so does using the, the body uh, uh, as a human shield uh, to try to stop state violence constitute a humane or inhumane act? So we start grappling with all these issues and with all these uh, fascinating questions and we decided to write our second book together. Thanks, Nicola. Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty obvious that you know, human shields is just two words, right? But the, the term is uh, when you, you look into it as a, in, even in a philosophical way, uh, and even more so a political way, is, it can be, can have very different meanings. Um, and in, in a way, I'd like to ask you this question, Neil, if we, if we take a step back, um, could you explain exactly what are human shields? So, Let's begin with the law. The law uh, uh, defines human shields as, as civilians or um, other people that it considers as, as protected, like prisoners of war, who are either forced or volunteer to shield a legitimate military target in order to deter the enemy from attacking it. Um, I'd like to read to you, Frank, the, the precise definition according to the additional protocols of the Geneva Convention from 1977. This is the most up-to-date definition. It, it, it's a bit complicated, but it's important for everyone to understand precisely what is going on here. So the, 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 the additional protocol defines shields as, and I quote, the presence or movement of the civilian population or individual civilians shall not be used to render certain points or areas immune from military operations, in particular in attempts to shield military objectives from attack or to shield favor or impede military operations. It's kind of condensed and convoluted, but I'd like to make one point about this definition. And that the law operates here through a kind of mechanism of avowal and disavowal. On the one hand, it avows the protected status of human shields because it tells us that they shall not be used, people, civilians shall not be used as human shields. It is illegal to use civilians or prisoners of war as human shields. But simultaneously, it disavows this protective status by asserting that human shields will not render the area immune from attack, thus suggesting that they can be killed. So in other words, a human shield it is illegal to use human shields because they are protecting people, but in certain circumstances, it is legal to kill them. So it is this avowal of the protective status and the disavowal and rendering them killable subjects that we found so interesting. And, and, and Neve, to, to, um, to follow up on what you've just said, um, are, are all human shields alike or or is there, or are they different types of, of shields? <clears throat> so when we began reading about human shields and looking at how they're defined by the different experts and so forth, we immediately noticed that there's two kinds of shields. Like in the beginning, we noticed one is the, the, the involuntary shields. It's people that are forced to become human shields like uh, uh, many people might have seen uh, a year, a year and a half ago, how the Indian military tied a citizen in Kashmir to a jeep 
and drove in the, in, in the five hours in villages and, and, and used his body so that supposedly people won't stone the, 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 the jeep. Uh, we know of a lot of instances <clears throat> of militaries using civilians to walk before them to ensure that roads or places are not booby trapped and so forth. So these are the involuntary shields. And then there's the voluntary shields, which are usually activists that, that in combat zones, and as we see recently in protests, uh, use their bodies to shield either civilians or civilian objects from the attack of militaries. In, in 2003, during the second Gulf War, hundreds of activists traveled to Iraq to serve as, as human shields. And, and it's a courageous, nonviolent, anti-militarist stance. But interestingly, we, we did a, a, a newspaper search of articles on human shields. We looked at the year 2015 and 2016 on major newspapers across the globe, and we found three million article. We found articles with three million instances of human shielding during that year, and then we tried to categorize them. And of those three million, zero point two of a single percent were voluntary shields, and five percent were involuntary shields. And then we asked ourselves, okay, so who are the 95% of human shields? And that's a third category of human shielding. And, and we and a few others call it proximate shields. And who are these proximate shields? These are shields that are trapped, or civilians that are trapped in war zones, like in, in the Gaza Strip, or in Mosul, in Iraq. And, and that are framed, that are cast as human shields. <coughs> Excuse me. So, for example, in 2016, when the, the Iraqi military, uh, backed by uh, uh, the US, tried to kick, recapture Mosul from ISIS hands, we suddenly saw a lot of press releases of how ISIS was using the civilians in the city as human shields. So uh, we have a hundred or a several hundred militants in Mosul, but suddenly there's a press release coming out of the United Nations saying these hundred or I think it was five or 800 militants are holding a hundred thousand civilians as human shields. And so we thought, okay, civilians trapped in war zones, any civilian trapped in a war zone is a human shield. But then we looked at 2014 when ISIS, when, when, when ISIS originally captured Mosul from the hands of the Iraqi military, and we looked at all the articles that described the way ISIS captured the city, and there was not a single mention of a human shield in Mosul. So in 2014, in a similar situation, there's no human shields. And in 2016, there's 100,000 human shields. So what is the difference? And then we understood that the proximity is not proximity to a war zone, but actually proximity to irregular fighters, non-state fighters, insurgents, terrorists, Islamic militants. That's what renders someone a human shield. So if we look, for example, at, at the, the wars on Gaza and the Hamas firing rockets on Tel Aviv, where Israel's central military base, central command is, and it injures or maybe kills Israeli civilians, they are never framed as human shields. But when Israel bombs Gaza City and targets the central command of Hamas in Gaza City and civilians are killed, then these civilians are not civilians any longer, but human shields. 
So if Hamas kills civilians, it is to blame for killing innocent lives. And if Israel kills Palestinian civilians, then Hamas is also to blame, since according to the existing logic, it is Hamas that has deployed the, these civilians as shields. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. And actually, bring, it brings us to my next question um, to you, Nicola. Um, you write that um, the history of human shields is also a history of who is included and who is excluded from the fold of humanity. Can you, can you explain us what you, what you actually mean by that? Yeah, there are two ways, uh, Frank, in which uh, the idea, human shield is connected and related to the idea of humanity. Uh, the first way is uh, uh, that in, in, in the very moment in which an enemy is accused of using human shields immediately, that enemy becomes inhumane, whereas the attacking party becomes the humane uh, actor, the humane warrior. And then there is the second way in which human shields are connected to the idea of humanity, uh, which is the kind of mechanism of inclusion, <coughs> inclusion that you mentioned in your, in your uh, question. So to answer your question, sure, uh, in order to be a human shield, one has to be considered human. And we know that in different historical periods, certain groups were not considered uh, as fully human. So let me, let me try to explain how this works in, with human shields. In, for instance, in, in certain intra-European wars, so between the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, only certain people, only notables, only people of power were deemed uh, valuable human beings that could be used to deter uh, attacks in war. So basically their social status was, the val was their value uh, and was what basically made them uh, uh, human shields. Uh, the enemy uh, would be basically afraid to shoot on its own notables, on its own uh, people of power. And uh, it would, it would not have made sense uh, at that time to use men from the proletariat, so, so from a different uh, social class, or women or children as human, as human shields, since uh, uh, these people were not valued as fully human beings and they could not deter in war. In, in, in a different context, so uh, in a different context, like uh, uh, colonized people in colonial wars or blacks in the American Civil War, uh, uh, these people could not be used as human shields since uh, uh, they were not considered as fully human beings. So they were conceived as racially inferior and thus not expandable as human shields. Uh, today, uh, women and children who uh, two centuries ago could not be used as human shields because they were not valuable, have become, have suddenly become the most prominent kind of uh, human shield. So the history that we, we try to reconstruct in the book is precisely this history of the shifting uh, value of the human, of the changing value of the human. And the figure of the human shield reveals this history with uh, extraordinary uh, clarity, I would say. And, I mean, you, you've both worked on, on the Palestine-Israel question, if, I, if we can call it this way, for, for many, many years. Uh, you, you actually begin the book with, with Gaza, and you end it with Gaza. But, but in between, you, you, I mean, you can see there's a very thorough research, um, because you talk about the American Civil War, you take us to the Franco-German War in Europe, to the Boer War in South Africa. There's discussions about Ethiopia, about Vietnam, about the war on terror, and about Black Lives Matter. There's even chapters um, about environmental shielding and computer games. But why did you decide to use Gaza as its frame? Uh, yeah, Gaza is the world and the world is Gaza. So let, let me try to, to explain. So the introduction uh, begins with the uh, well-known story of uh, uh, Rachel Corey, who, when she was uh, uh, 
23 year old in March 2003 at the peak of the second Palestinian Intifada of the second Palestinian uprising was uh, crushed to death as she tried to prevent basically uh, an Israeli caterpillar, uh, uh, a military bulldozer from uh, destroying the home of a local pharmacist, uh, Samir Nasrallah. And uh, the book concludes with the march of return on the so-called Gaza border, where um, Israeli snipers have been killing protesters, basically, while claiming that these Palestinians are not really civilians, but they are uh, human shields. So the same trope that was used during the two Gaza wars was applied to protests. Our claim uh, in the book um, and the reason we frame it in such a way is that Gaza is in a way a prophecy and one might uh, add not a cheerful prof prophecy. So let me try to explain further. The framing of the Palestinian civilians taking part in, 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 in the protests as uh, human shields uh, tells us that all of the protesters are basically legitimate target. Therefore, the Israeli military cannot be accused of perpetrating crimes against civilians for the simple reason that uh, basically there are no civilians in Gaza. Civilians have disappeared. Uh, this is the argument that Israel has constructed basically to justify the deployment of lethal violence against uh, Gaza's civilian population. Uh, and, you know, this is not different from other colonial contexts in which colonial armies completely disregarded the distinction between combatants and non-combatants and carried out basically uh, uh, crimes against the indigenous populations. Uh, in the same way, Israel refuses to differentiate between the military and civil spheres in the Gaza Strip. Uh, however, in, in, in this case, the way Israel invokes the figure of the human shield also exposes uh, something else. It exposes uh, a deep, inherent relationship between civilianhood being a civilian, and citizenship, being a citizen, that uh, is very significant and is very urgent. For, for stateless uh, Palestinians trapped in, in Gaza, the, uh, the right to enjoy the uh, protections offered to civilians by international law is deeply intertwined with the right to liberate themselves from uh, colonial occupation. And, achieve uh, the, the status of citizens within uh, a state of their own. So in Gaza, uh, the protection offered by the law and the right to self-determination uh, and citizenship are denied simultaneously at the same time. This is what we see uh, by analyzing uh, uh, this, uh, the protests and, 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 and the two wars on Gaza. So we believe that in many ways the situation in Palestine uh, may also very well predicting our future. Why? Uh, well, Israel's uh, treatment of Gaza's civilian population is undoubt without doubt uh, extreme. But the same logic driving Israel's security forces is not different. That logic is not that different from uh, the logic that, for instance, informs security forces in other areas of the world uh, that cast their own citizenry, especially marginalized groups, as security threats. Uh, as the protests, for instance, in, in Standing Rock, from Standing Rock to Kashmir that we've mentioned before, or, or the protests in Ferguson uh, reveal. So what, what do I want to say? That the threat of using lethal violence against demonstrators is dangerous, not only because of the harm uh, it inflicts, but also because it frames civilian protesters as enemies who can be confronted with uh, military force. So to conclude my, my, my answer, it is precisely in this sense that Gaza uh, becomes a, 
a terrifying prophecy. Uh, it exposes how the denial of civilian protections in war zones is informing also attacks on citizens participating in protests uh, uh, from the Americas to Europe and, and the Middle East and all the way to Asia and Australia. The almost complete, uh, I would say, erosion of the civilian in Gaza is a, a nomen, a, a sign of the of, of what? Of the in increasing precarity of citizenship and the protections that it uh, it promises. Yes, I mean, uh, we are many, I think, um, around that says that the sort of Israelization of our societies is, is very real, right? You can, I mean, you mentioned Ferguson, the militarization of police, um, and, and in a way, like, uh, you know, using Palestine, Gaza as a, a laboratory, right? Um, an experiment that can be exported all around the world. And, and this is not, um, uh, you know, um, this is real and we see it like every day. And I'd like to end with this actually, Niamh. Um Nicola mentioned Ferguson, Black Lives Matter. We've been reading a lot about the appearance of human shields in the Black Lives Matter protest in the United States. Uh, can you say something about the proliferation of human shields in civil protest, what it signifies and what kind of problems it might um, engender? So, yeah, we're seeing uh, uh, many more privileged groups participate in these protests, in the Black Lives Matter protest, and we're, what we've been witnessing is how they've been using their bodies as, as human shields to protect black protests, black protesters across the country. And I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think this underscores several processes about uh, taking place right now about the American landscape. I mean, one of these is the, the militarization of the police forces. And, and you see that in the United States, not only in the United States. So you have police departments now in the US that, that boast that they have military Humvees, military helicopters, some even have tanks. Uh, and, and, and their police officers are trained often by ex-Navy SEALs and, and Army Rangers. So this militarization alongside uh, Trump's support of white supremacy, as we saw in, in, in the debate uh, two nights ago, his efforts to cast uh, uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement as the enemy of the state, and his, his, his willingness to send federal troops to stop the protests has increased the levels of violence taking place now in the in the, in the United States. And so what we see is introduction of, of basically warfare strategies in the civil sphere where police uh, now use flash grenades and rubber bullets uh, and send riot uh, teams with full military gear to stop the protesters. But alongside this move, we also see civilian citizens even those that in the past were less politicized, joining the civil protest and adopting strategies that civilians adopt in war zones. And so as the police officers have become more like militaries, citizens have become more like civilians in war zones. And this in many ways kind of echoes what Nicola was saying just a minute ago. Now, it's clear that to draw a comparison between the, the civilians trapped in war zones, like in Raqqa, in, in Syria, or Mosul, in, in, in Iraq, or Gaza City, and citizens protesting in the United States, is not yet exactly the same, and because the levels of violence in the war zones is still substantially much, much greater. 
Yet not unlike the civilians in the Middle East, in Africa, who have borne the brunt of the violence of the war on terror, in the United States, it's the citizens of color, particularly the, Na the, the Native Americans and the African Americans that are the prime targets of this violence. Now, the appearance of Westerners, Western internationals as human shields in conflicts and white human shields in civilian protests illuminates quite clearly the global racial hierarchies. And so we have this kind of echoing of these racial hierarchies. And again, what Nicola talked about, who is considered fully human and who is not. And, and, and it shows us that some lives matter more than the lives of others. Some lives are mourned, as Judith Butler said, and some lives are not mourned. And yet within this moment that, that there's this, I don't know, this extreme levels of violence in US cities, we also see hope. And we see more and more white citizens outraged by this hierarchy and willingness to put their bodies on the, in the line of fire to prevent attacks against black citizens. And, 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 and what and maybe I'll end with that, that this, this anti-racist solidarity in the United States is taking on a new shape, I think. And, and that is a sign of hope. Thanks, Niv. I mean, it's always important, I guess, when we can to, to end with some kind of hope, right? Because we live in very dark times, so it's nice to to potentially think that there is a way a way out of um, of these uh, dark times. So again, thanks to you both. I think it's a, a very timely book because it's so important nowadays. We know how language is used um, in the media in, and in politics sphere to to frame certain issues. So it's very important to to analyze it and deconstruct it. Uh, when, when possible. And I think the term human shields is so often used um, um, by the mainstream media and by politicians when it helps them uh, frame a certain issue that it's important to sort of reverse the, the thinking. So thanks again. Um, Thank good you, luck. Frank. Good luck with thanks everything. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Yeah, good luck with, uh, with everything and uh, we'll, we'll be in touch soon. Bye-bye.